two reasons. First of all, if you pretend to yourself it hasn't happened, it hasn't happened, and that's convenient. In the, the jungle of commerce, the heart attack victim is a wounded animal, and he might get eaten by the other animals, so you don't, you try not to pretend it hasn't happened. And I've seen this happen time and time again among colleagues who've had them. Um, it is, I'm, I, I now know, because Liz has done the research on it, a very common reaction. Nothing's happened to me. I'm just as good as I was before. Ho, ho, ho. Aren't I a wonderful fella? Here I am, right out of, out of, a, out of a heart attack bed and doing my job as always. One day, it was my father, actually, who said to me, um, you can't do anything. A man's got to find these things out for himself. You know, you just have to let him be. Um, and a number of people started saying similar things to me, and I really consciously started to let go, which was terrifying. Uh, because in the beginning, I did look after him in the most basic sense, like making sure he took medication on time and got his sleep and that nobody bothered him and monitored the phone calls and people coming and the mail and that sort of thing. Eventually, John's refusal to accept the fact of his heart attack caught up with him. What comes with recovery from a heart attack is hypochondria, massive hypochondria. Every little twinge you interpret as the next one. And in the middle of a presentation to a, a new client, I suddenly began feeling an arm go, and I thought, uh-oh, here it comes again. Now, I don't want to lose this presentation, so I'll get up quietly and I'll move out of the room so I won't have an attack and, and, uh, and blow it. Uh, I'll go to my office, and when I went to my office, the, the, the buffet was laid out for lunch, and I thought, well, I, it would be quite inappropriate for them to come and find uh, the chairman there all having a heart attack and during the buffet, so I'll go to the doctor. Meanwhile, I was breathing deeply all this time. In point of fact, what I was doing was hyperventilating. And I hyperventilated myself straight into a, an intensive care ward at 175 pounds a day, diagnosed the following day. And once that happened, once I realized that I really had thought I had a second heart attack, then I began taking seriously the, all the things that Liz wrote about subsequently. Mm -hmm. But it took that second, that second blow to break through the denial process. Um, I think when the second thing happened. I think he decided then he didn't want to die. That there was something worth living for. But he, he had to come to that on his own. You know, it's not enough to say to somebody, you know, you must live for me. I mean, I could say to him, please, please don't die. You know what you're doing? I'm absolutely terrified you're going to die. Um, and, and you can say it once, maybe twice, but beyond that you can't go. You can just make that plea and people will either hear you and it'll mean something or they won't. Very gradually, John began to change his lifestyle. He remained chairman of the company, but delegated much more. He began to slow down and enjoy more relaxing pastimes, like bird watching, largely as a result of some subtle encouragement from Liz. Well, I, I now realize some of the clever little devices she, she employed. Um, she rigged a, a visit to Alderborough, a little town up on the Suffolk coast, and bought me a pair of binoculars and then walked me. Now, I hated to walk. It's, walking is a boring, laborious, unpleasant thing. But given something to do when you walk, like the binoculars and the birds, it suddenly became a bearable thing. And that worked. And then she began dropping one or two more of those things in without intruding on the rest of the frenzied life. And then, it's when I, <laughs> when I found a new life with my, with my imagined second heart attack, um, I was, it was, I was ready, and it was time. Oh, I see. Being when an option is to die, it's amazing how easy it is to knock a few things out of your life that you really didn't like to do anyway, or um, uh, shouldn't do anyway. The um, I discovered a lot of a number of things about myself. I discovered why I worked so hard. Uh, why I was running so fast. And it wasn't to be, to be rich, particularly. It was not to be poor. Liz has changed as well. She gave up her full-time job and became a student again. She took a degree in psychology and after considerable research has written a book about how couples can cope with a heart attack. 
um, I'm trying to talk to the wives and families and also the victims themselves. It's about the practicalities, what you can do with yourself when he's in hospital and the sort of things he's going to have to go through. Uh, explaining some of the medical terminology uh, and the kind of tests he might have to have, what might happen. And then dealing in much more detail with the rehabilitation afterwards, um, how you cope with anxiety and worry. Um, how you look at some of the more meaningful issues, like why has he had it? What does it mean? What does it mean for both of you? And for a wife, this often means looking at how much you've been in charge of what's happened. You know, maybe you've pushed him into a bigger job than he can manage, or a larger house than your finances can sustain. Maybe you're too ambitious. You know, maybe you have to change your ideas a bit. Useful advice. Mm. What would you add to it, John? What would you advise someone? watching this who had it we've been in this the same situation we've been in i would advise them to admit they've had it it is the hardest thing to do and probably the most essential one you are now going to die a lot sooner than you probably thought you were theoretically you are going to die sooner if you don't believe it listen to your insurance man <laughs> he believes it something massive has happened to you and you better you better believe it the second thing that seems to have helped, helped, helped me a lot was this priorita prioritization. What really is important in your life and what do you want to keep and what isn't and what's eating away at you and what is, what is helping, what's nourishing. The mm -hmm. sitting down and sorting those two things out seems to help me a lot and I found it helped most people who've walked the line through it. And the third thing is this exercise, peculiarly enough. A nice cardiologist told me something which is probably wrong, and that is that the heart could repair itself by opening new blood vessels to replace the ones that, um, uh, that had been killed. By Absolutely the, true. By the, is it? Yeah. Well, I believe that. And that justified my going back and forth in that swimming pool every day. I was making a new heart. And that idea that you can contribute somehow to the repair of the damage is marvelously comforting. Aside from that, I read my wife's book. <laughs> Clearly for both of you, it's been a curiously enriching experience, hasn't it? Yes, yes. in retrospect. Yes, I would yeah. say so. We've certainly yeah. become much closer. Life has been more meaningful mm -hmm. and taken different turns. And Pam and Roy, you'll remember, said exactly the same thing. Oh, and by the way, since I went to see them, you'll be happy to know Roy's gone back to work and he's coping really well. So you see, it, it is possible for what is essentially a life-threatening experience to be a, a life-improving one. But you will need some keys to make it a life-improving one for you if you become one of the, well, let's face it, hundreds of thousands of families every year who are affected by heart attack. It's, it's been described as an epidemic, and it's a very real problem. Oh, and it doesn't happen only to men. It's happening more and more to women, the middle-aged age group. Now, there are three things, as I say, that you can do to help yourself cope. Um, the first, I think, is to learn. Learn about the illness, learn about what causes it, learn about how stress affects it, learn as much as you can. And for this, you'll find Lizzie's heart attack recovery book really a gold mine. It's not the only one that's available. There are lots of free bits of literature. I'll tell you how to get those shortly. But this is particularly useful. And of course, it's written from personal experience, and that makes a big difference. Now, the second thing you have to do is to accept what has happened. Learn to face up to it. You've got to face the fact that, that this is something that you're going to have to live with. You've had a heart attack and the risk is there. If you don't accept it, you may finish up like, uh, remember poor John did, who sort of uh, overbreathed himself into a hyperventilated uh, panic attack and finish up back in the intensive care ward. So, so learning is important and so is acceptance. It helps you to change your lifestyle. And thirdly, share your experiences with other people. Now, you may find other people to talk to about what has happened to you and your family just through the cardiac ward. Some very fine friendships have grown up that way. Or you may find it easier to get in touch with people through the Chest and Heart Association or similar contact groups. And, as usual, I've prepared one of my fact sheets. What I've put in it is not only information about books and leaflets, and, but a lot about diet and, and how you can cope, but quite a lot of guidance. I hope you'll find it useful.
Claire Rayner is unable to enter into personal correspondence with viewers, but the leaflet mentioned in the programme, which contains further information and useful addresses, is available by sending a large stamped addressed envelope to Claire Rayner's casebook, BBC Television, London W12 8QT. And you'll also find that address on CFAX, page 189. Next week, Claire Rayner opens her casebook on the prejudice still faced by homosexuals. That's next Tuesday at 11.15. These are programmes for tomorrow night on BBC One. Tom O'Connor's special guests in I've Got a Secret at 6.55 are Olympic gold medalist Tessa Sanderson and Jimmy Hill. There's comedy with Sharon and Elsie at 7.30 and in Dallas at 8 o'clock, Pam makes a chilling discovery over the mystery surrounding her fiancé's disappearance. Barry Took presents your points of view at 8.45. Sports Night at 9.35 features highlights of the third round UEFA Cup matches between the holders, Spurs, playing away against Bohemians of Prague, and Manchester United's encounter with Dundee United. There's also Rugby Union with the touring Australian side doing battle with the leading Welsh club, Pontypool. Finally, there's film entertainment when Anton Differing stars as the man who could cheat death at 10.45. Programmes for Wednesday night on BBC One. And now with the weather details, here's Jim Bacon. Hello. Well, this high really has made a nuisance of itself. It's led to a lot of very foggy weather, some quite frosty weather too, all because of the light winds uh, uh, circulating around it. Uh, one other problem is that it's caused a lot of interference on your television screens as well, and those conditions aren't likely to move until the high itself moves, and I should say that's going to be with us probably for a fair part of tomorrow near the eastern side of the country, but over the western side of Britain, things are very different. You've got much stronger winds, southwesterly winds, cloudier weather as well, just a little rain at the moment. You'll get a period of fairly heavy rain for a time in northwestern parts during tomorrow and then we'll have to look down to the southwest because there'll be something else happening there there'll be a new low developing and that's going to come up towards the country during Thursday and Friday bringing a change to wet and unsettled weather and I think seeing off the last of the frost and fog the forecast chart for noon tomorrow, well, you can see on that that the high is beginning to edge away. There are rather more isobars on the chart, so that strengthening wind should lift some of the fog tomorrow, and the front in the west just edging a bit closer towards us. Uh, for tonight, though, the winds are still very light, and the high is still uh, plenty close enough to mean a lot of fog around, and even though it might thin in a few places now and again, it could well settle back in again later on in the night, and temperatures pretty widely in England now, well below freezing, so a frosty night as well. Western parts of England and Wales, the border counties, much of Scotland and Northern Ireland, a cloudy night, a milder night, just a few spots of rain here and there, but not very much to speak of, but at least you haven't got that frost to worry about, nor have you got the fog. Tomorrow, that's also going to be the area which escapes the frost and fog, but in central and eastern parts of England, once more, it's going to remain right through the day, pretty cold, raw, misty weather, the fog thinning very slowly, probably lifting into a blanket of uh, dull grey cloud as time goes on, but it will be cold, temperatures only up to 3 centigrade. Other areas, fairly cloudy for much of the day, not a lot of sunshine around, and later on in the day, the rain in those northwestern parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland will become heavier and more persistent. And that's it. <laughs> If a man with dangerous animals to feed went about it like this, you would not be surprised at the results. Then why on earth, when it's foggy, do you drive down the motorway like this, straight into situations you can't see? After all, it may not be just your neck. That was a public information film. Time is just after 14 minutes to midnight, and you'll find Brian Matthew holding the fort on Radio 2 at the moment with Round Midnight, which is followed by Tuesday's Night Ride with Bill Reynolds at 1am. But we've come to the parting of the ways, so from all of us on BBC One, good night to you. <laughs>